going to start this morning. Zechariah chapter 4. In Zechariah, which is the second to last book of the Old Testament, as you turn there, I just want to encourage you once more, uh, please do keep Brother Joel and his wife, Nikki, and their family in your prayers as they seek out the Lord's will for them. Uh, Zechariah chapter 4, and uh, look with me, if you would, at verse number 10. I'm just going to read the first part of the verse, and uh, here's what it says. For who hath despised the day of small things? For who hath despised the day of small things? That's a great question. Let's go Lord in prayer. Father, this morning, one more time, we, we do ask for your help. And uh, Lord, I pray that uh, our own flesh and our senses would get the best of us now. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to concentrate on the words of God. Lord, I just pray that there would be a, a good spirit in this place, Lord, where you have liberty to move and illuminate show us things, and Lord, uh, pray that uh, you'd be over there in the nursery as well with those workers and their, uh, what they're doing, bless them for that, and Lord, I just pray that everyone that's here, or would be here to get something from you, and, uh, Lord, I, I pray you'd show us something this morning, we ask in Jesus' name, amen. 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 You ever heard the, uh, you ever heard the saying that uh, preparation meets opportunity? You know, oftentimes we think, uh, you know, about some of the little things like Bible reading, you know. Well, that's just a little thing. Surely that can't affect all these other things. Surely that can't really help me with this. And, and really what you're saying is, well, that's just a small thing. You know, that's just a little thing. And I, I want to tell you this. In business, in life, if you're not looking for opportunities, you're not prepared for them, hey, you're not going to get them whenever they come your way. Right. You know how many times we, we say to God, God, would you please open this door? God, would you open up a window in heaven and pour out this blessing? And then when he does, we right, walk right by it. Don't even know that it's there. You know why? Because we're not prepared for it. Okay. And I want to talk to you this morning about some windows of opportunity, some things that God has opened up windows for us that I think are blessing. Look at the Old Testament at Joshua. Go there. And Joshua is definitely one of those uh, books in the Bible where there's a lot of war. And uh, Joshua chapter 2, go over there with me to Joshua chapter 2. And in Joshua chapter 2, you read about this lady named Rahab. Now, uh, let me just say this. We're going to read everything about uh, the, the, the story here from chapter 2 to chapter 6. Uh, but I'll, I'll just say this. If you haven't read the book of Joshua, Rahab is not the person that you really expect to be used by God. You say, why is that? Because by trade, if you want to use that word, and I use it very loosely, uh, by trade or by profession or by career, you know how Rahab is known? In the Bible, she is known as Rahab the harlot. Not exactly a title that you want your daughters to have when they grow up, amen? amen. Not exactly if you're a lady to kind of talk. I mean, listen, no one wants to be called... You know, I'm trying to think of a name of some lady that's not here. I'm not going to do it because I'll probably mess up and say someone's name, the harlot. But no one wants to be called that. But that was Rahab's name. That's how she was known. She's the last person you would ever guess to be associated with a window of opportunity from God. Look at Joshua chapter 2. And look at verse 18. And I want to tell you what she, what she did. Uh, Rahab took these men that were coming in from the nation of Israel to spy out the land. And Rahab said, listen, uh... I'm going to let you, I know who you guys are. I've heard of your fame. Uh, my people are afraid of you. We know who your God is. And I fear that God. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to let you guys, I'm going to hide you guys. I'm not going to tell the soldiers from my country when they come looking for you that you're here. I'm going to hide. You're going to be safe here. So look what the men tell her. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this line of scarlet thread. Where? In the window. In the window which thou didst let us down by. And thou shalt bring thy father, and thy mother, and thy brethren, and all thy father's house home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of thy house into the blood, uh, into the street, his blood shall be upon his own head, and we will be guiltless. And whosoever shall be with thee in the house, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. You know basically what they're saying? Hey, listen, whoever we find out there in the streets, they're dead. <laughs> because we're coming to take this land. God told us to do that. Hey, listen, that's what God told them to do. Read it yourself. 
He told them to go in that land and take it and consume it and make it theirs. That's the promised land for the nation of Israel. And so they tell her, listen, if someone goes out the door and they go some other way, we're not responsible for that. They're, they're dead. They're gone. But if we see somebody in that window, and we see that scarred thread down there, coming down, and we see those folks in that window, you know what? They're safe. We'll make sure that nothing happens to them. Look at Joshua chapter 6. Go a couple chapters later. Joshua chapter 6. See, what are we going to read about? Hey, man, these guys kept their word. <laughs> Rahab did exactly what she was told to do. Look at verse 23. And the young men that were spies went in and brought Rahab and her father and her mother and her brethren and all that she had. And they brought out all her kindred and left them without the camp of Israel. And they burnt the city with fire and all that was there and only the silver, the gold, and the vessels of brass and of iron they put in the treasury of the house of the Lord. And Joshua saved Rahab the harlot alive in her father's household. You say, what was that window? That was a window of association. You know what happened? They said, hey, take this scar. Like, you, ever, you ever stop and think about why things happen in the Bible? You ever stop and think about, listen, why, why a scarlet thread? Why a thread that's of the color red? I mean, it could have been uh, a white thread. It could have been a purple thread. But he says a scarlet thread. You know what the scarlet is? It's the color of blood. And they say, hey, listen, Rahab, now, you may not understand all that this means or all that this, uh, that this matters that much, but it has to be a scarlet color thread. Okay, fine. She puts out that scarlet. You know what that says to everyone from the nation of Israel when they come by? You know why? It's a picture of blood. You know what we have as Christians? We have a window of opportunity as far as our association goes. What do people know you for? Listen, if they are looking at the window of your soul, the window of your life, the window of your heart, would they see a scarlet thread? Would they see something that reminds them of the blood of Jesus Christ? I hope so. Remember the book of Exodus? Go back to Exodus. Look there in Exodus chapter 12. I want you to look there. Exodus chapter 12. Exodus chapter 12. And look at, uh, look at verse number 3. This is what God tells them about the Passover lamb. And you know, the, every... Hey, listen, do you believe that every word of God matters? Every word of God is inspired. It's there for a reason. All right, look at, look at verse number 3. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a what? A lamb. According to the house of their father, what's the next two words? A lamb. You know what he's saying? There has to be a sacrifice. Look at verse number 4. And if the household be, uh, be too little for, what's the next two words? Oh, yeah, just the same thing I read in verse. No, 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 no. You read a lamb. Now it's talking about the lamb. Look at the next verse. Look at verse number five. What's the first two words? Listen, when you got saved, you know what? Jesus Christ should not be just some character in the Bible you need to take for you. He should be your best friend. He should be your lamb. And when people look at the window of, of, of who you are, they look inside, they peer inside of your home, spiritually speaking. They look inside at who you are and what you're about, what you spend your time doing. Would they see a scar on the thread? Would they see something that reminds them of his sacrifice? You say, what is that? That's a window of association. Can I say this, guys? We live in a time where there's more ways for us to be associated with truth than ever before. You know, I get tired of hearing Christians say it's just so hard in the day and age in which we live to be a Christian. I don't see anyone getting thrown to lions. I don't see anyone getting thrown in jail for being a Christian. You know what it is? We are soft. Yeah, and because someone makes fun of us or doesn't like something that we believe, we back down a little bit. Listen, the, the world should be able to see some things that you're associated with. Primarily the person of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. That started through. Now think about it. I mean, Rahab could have said, well, that's a dumb idea. I can think of a better way for me to be saved. They said, no, it's just a start thread. It's all we want you to do. There's a window of association. Say, what is the picture of the blood of Jesus Christ? What is the purpose? Let me ask you. When people see who you are, what you're about, and the 
relationships you have, do they see something that reflects the Christian life? You know what? Listen, I understand. We are imperfect people, and we all have our own issues. And you know what? You like some things this way, and I like some things this way. And, and, and uh, you know what? I, I'm going to train my kid not to do this. You think that's okay? Fine. You know, we have differences in, in, in areas. But you know what? And we have problems. And sometimes we even conflict with each other. But I'd much rather be associated with you than the world. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. What's the purpose of that association? Well, for, for our salvation, I mean, Rahab's family was saved. Yeah. Man, but beyond that, you know what it was about? It was about affecting the generations to come from Rahab's family. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter number 5, and look at verse number 11. What's, we see the picture of the blood of Jesus Christ. The purpose of that association, that window of opportunity, is edification. You say, why is you know, just being, something as simple as being at church so important? Because I need you. I need to be edified. I need to be built up. No, you're the pastor. I mean, you and God are like that. Yeah, right. I like that. I like for me not to need you, but the reality is, I need God's people. And if you think to yourself that you don't, something's not quite right there. Your desire is not to be edified. Listen, you should desire to be edified. To be built up in your faith. First Thessalonians chapter 5, look at verse 11. Wherefore, comfort yourselves. What's the next word? Together. Not apart. Together. And edify. What's the next two words? What is, what's the next two words? One another. One another. Amen. Just make sure you're still with me. You know what we're supposed to be here for? You know what this association is all about? I, mean, I was talking with someone the other day. Yesterday, as a matter of fact. Went up to a gentleman. Gave him a gospel track. And uh, told me his name. And said, yeah, I'm saved. I got saved in the Little Baptist Church when I was a kid. And uh, anyways, he got talking with the guy. And uh, I said, well, you know what we're talking to him? I said, you go to church anywhere? He says, yeah, man. It's this place. I'm not going to name it. He said, it's this place. He says, it's rocking, man. And it's all I could get the guy to say. I was like, okay, where's the edification? Where's the word of God? Where's the, hey, where's the depth there? Guys, listen, we don't come together to be entertained. We come together to be edified. The association we have one with another. You know what, spiritually speaking, at the Dominguez family, God says, the world should be able to look and see in the window a scarlet thread. At the police family, they should see the same thing. At the table, you know, they should be able to see that. And when there's opportunity to come together like the Bible says and be in that association, man, what a blessing. You know, I know some of you are thinking, why, why does anyone ever preach to people about going to church when they're at church? Because there's going to come a day when you won't see it as that important. And I want you to remember it. And the truth of the matter is, if we live in some places like Cuba, where this is not freely allowed, you know what those people do? They crave getting together. They crave getting you know, a, a Bible and being able to open up. Listen. They have to share one Bible in, in a village. I know a missionary that goes to Cuba, and he's got to bring Bibles little by little. And man, they have to share a Bible for a whole group of people, and the, the pastor will allow them. They'll cut it. Okay, brother, you take this portion, and you take this portion, and we'll come back together on Sunday in secret, and we'll get together, and we'll get the Bible together. And you know what we do? We complain if we have to drive a couple miles to church. Complain if the, the weather's not cooperating. Complain if this is right. Or that brother said this or she didn't shake my hand. Or whatever else. You know what all that stuff is? It's so petty. Yeah. What if? What if tomorrow? And I, I think, I don't believe this is going to happen tomorrow. Okay? I'm not being a weirdo or an end time you know, fanatic or anything. What if tomorrow? They said, okay, no more Bible believing churches allowed. As long as you're okay with accepting all of these sins into your church. And as long as you're okay with recognizing this, the government that gives you the liberty you have, not God, will let you have church. Otherwise, you can't have it. And they shut us down. Would it matter to you if you couldn't just be with God's people? I think for some of us, it would be an eye-opening experience. Because you know you take for granted? The fact that you Let me say this secondly. We see a window of association. Let me talk to you about a window of escape. A window of escape. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 11. There's a really neat story. The Bible is filled with them, as Brother Joel alluded to earlier. 
And uh, there's all kinds of stories about people escaping through windows. You know that? Yeah. David escaped someone one time outside of a window. Uh, we just read about Rahab the harlot and her family escaping because of the window. And uh, here we're going to read about Paul the Apostle escaping in a basket. I mean, these people let it out in a basket through a window. What a weird story. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, and look at verse number 31. The God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is blessed forevermore, knoweth that I lie not. He's like, listen, I'm about to tell you something that's a little funny, and you guys may think I'm blowing this story up. You know, it's almost like the guy that says, I went fishing, and my fish was this big, right? <laughs> Where are the pictures? I, I didn't get any pictures of it, brother. You just got to trust me on this one, okay? You know, Paul is saying, listen, I'm not lying to you. Look at verse 32. In Damascus, the governor under Eretus, the king, kept the city of the Damascenes with the garrison desirous to apprehend me. All these soldiers were trying to get me. And through a window in a basket was I let down by the wall. And what happened? He escaped. I heard a preacher one time say that a fiery temptation, a fiery trial requires a fire escape. You know, as a Christian, you're going to have temptations. You're going to have things that draw you. And you know, there's going to be some things that Wayne struggles with that I, don't, I look at and I go, man, why are you still struggling with that? And there's things he'll look at in my life and go, why? how can that tempt you? You know why? Because we're all wired differently. And our flesh desires different things. And our enemy knows how to get each and every one of us. And there's going to be things that you're tempted with. And if you're not looking for a way out, you'll just keep on going down that path. You know what I, I, I encourage you to do? The Bible says to walk circumspectly. That means when you see trouble ahead, hey, look for the way out. Uh, look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 10. I, I believe it's important that you understand uh, uh, that, listen, uh, you have a way out of temptation. You do not have to succumb to it. Listen, just because we are sinners, it doesn't mean we have to sin in that particular moment. Uh, you have a way out with God's help. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, before we even read this verse, when's the last time you find yourself doing something and then you go, ah, I'm doing it again. You, you ever done that before? Yep. Okay. You know, what, you know what that comes from as a result of? It comes as a result of God providing a way out and not taking it. It's that simple. Look at 1 Corinthians 10. You say, well, I don't believe it's that simple. Look what the Bible says, not what I say. Look at verse 13. There hath no temptation taken you, but such as is common to man. You know what sometimes you say? Well, Pastor Adrian, you just don't understand. I don't. Maybe I don't. But I know somebody who does. You know, he says, hey, whatever temptation you're going through, someone else has gone through it before, it's common. Mm -hmm. But he doesn't stop there, thank God. Amen. Mm -hmm. He says, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above the air able, but will, listen, with the temptation, also make a way to what? Yeah. You've got to look for that window. That window of opportunity. Listen, let me give you an example. Uh, Justin comes up to me and starts talking. We're having a casual conversation. Then he starts talking about another brother in the Lord, which he's never done. I'm just using that as a... You're just you're close to me, okay? We're right here, all right? And, and, and he starts to, we're having a kind of conference, and all of a sudden he goes, you know, that Wayne guy. i like, you know, Wayne, it's good to pick on Wayne. That Wayne guy. He starts talking, I go, oh, brother, you know what? Gotta go. God bless you, see ya. Say, what is that? That's a window of opportunity. You know what most people do? Tell me more. <laughs> what don't you like about Brother Wayne? Because there's some things I don't like about him, too. So now... We're friends. Yeah. You, see, yeah. <laughs> you see how that works? Hey, listen, honestly, there's so many examples in our own lives daily like that. Hey, listen, it's 11.30 at night. Ladies, help me here. Okay? I, I need you, ladies, come, please, bear with me, okay? 11.30 at night, and you roll over and say, honey, let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> Please don't do that. Don't do that, please. Because usually it doesn't end very well. Okay? But you know what, as men, you know, instead of barking, I'm tired. Honey, can we talk about it in the morning? I don't think this is the best time. You say, oh, that's just, that's, oh, that's a way to escape. I'm being serious. Rather than doing what most people do. You say, what is that? It's looking for an opportunity to do that which is right instead of succumbing to that which you know is wrong. Sin will always take you further than you want to go. Yeah. It'll make you pay more than you want to pay and make you stay longer than you want to stay. See, that's sin. 
Look at James. Go to James with me if you would. James. James chapter 1. You know, oftentimes what we do, you ever, ever read the, listen, I love the, if anyone asks me what your favorite book in the Bible is, Brother Dominguez, I would say it's the book of Genesis. Because the book of Genesis, to me, sets the pace for the entire Bible. You know, when it comes to temptation, when it comes to dealing with Satan, when it comes to dealing with family, when it comes to dealing with work, I mean, all those subjects are covered in that first book. And, and it's amazing to me that when, when God confronts Adam, he goes to Adam and he says, Adam, who told you you were naked? Uh, Lord, the woman that thou gavest me, she gave me this fruit and I, I ate of it and her. Okay, Eve, you're going to Eve right now. Eve, what happened? The serpent. Okay, serpent, what happened? See, what is that called? It's called the blame game. been around for thousands of years. It's not new. But you don't know what most of us don't do whenever we sin? We don't acknowledge it was our own succumbing to that temptation. Amen. It was our being drawn away because we didn't put a stop to it. We didn't find that window of escape when we had the opportunity. Look, if you would, at James chapter 1. James chapter 1. Look at verse 13. James chapter 1 in verse 13. And it says this, Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, he tempted to any man. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away because his wife, because her husband, because the kids have him. No! Because of what? His own lust. And enticed. Then when lust hath conceived, it bringeth forth sin, and sin, when it's finished, bringeth forth death. You know what? Listen, instead of finding yourself looking at stuff on the internet, you should do, man, get away from it. You know, if you can't have a phone without doing something, you shouldn't do it. Then get it, get rid of it. All that's just so extreme. Is it? What would you rather have? Would you rather have a close relationship with Jesus Christ or find yourself succumbing? I'm not saying it has to be that extreme, but think about it for a little bit. Where are the ways, the windows of opportunity you can escape things on a daily basis? And rather than doing that, you find yourself succumbing. And typically, when we find ourselves succumbing, we start doing this. Instead of saying, Lord, it's me. And I didn't take that window of escape that you provided for me. I asked you this question last week. I'm going to ask you again. Are you a Bible believer? Yes or no? Are you, or do you believe yes. the words that are in that book? Okay. Then God says, not Pastor Adrian, God says... He will not let you be tempted above the able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape. He may go there. Do you believe that? Yes. Okay. Then here's what you do. The next time that temptation comes your way, look for a way out. Because God is there. You know what he's saying? Hey, over here. Jump through this one. <laughs> I think the most frustrating thing is getting in the backseat of a car, and they have those child window locks. <laughs> you know, and you get back there and you hit the button, you know. That would be like purgatory for me. Yeah. Especially if my wife is driving because she likes the wind. Ladies, you like the windows up so your carriers get messed up. You know? And, you know, I'm hitting the button. Ah! Oh, it would be like a nightmare for me. And you know how some Christians do? They live like that. Oh, trying to hit the button and they just don't say, hey, listen, God's not the one that puts the lock on that. You do. God wants you to find a way to escape. God's the one that provides that way to escape. The Bible says in St. Corinthians 11, we read it earlier, that Paul escaped from the governor's hands. See, what did the governor want to do? He wanted to kill him. <laughs> he wanted to take him and destroy him. You know what your enemy wants to do? The same thing. You know what God does sometimes? Psst. Talk about, it. Talk about an adventure in the Christian life. Psst. Over here. Here's the window. Come on down. You and me, buddy, we're going to escape together. That's what the Lord does for you. Are you looking for it? That's the question. We see a window of association, a window of escape. Let me give you a window of hearing. Look at Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20. Acts chapter 20, and look at verse number 7. Acts chapter 20, verse 7. Upon the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow. Now listen, if I'm going to leave tomorrow to go on a trip, I'm probably not going to preach until midnight. 
I, I think we'll keep it short and sweet and keep it to 30 minutes and we're done. Everyone's happy then, right? We get to go eat lunch and we got to church and we're, we're done with it. Paul preached until midnight this particular occasion. And it says this in verse 8. And there were many lights in the upper chamber where they were gathered together. And there sat in a what? A certain young man named Eutychus. Being fallen into a deep sleep, and as Paul was long preaching, like some of you think I am, as Paul was long preaching, he sunk down with sleep and fell down from the third loft and was taken out of dead. You know what most people do? Most people use this opportunity to talk about how Eutychus was a lazy bum. Now he fell asleep and he should have stayed awake. Hey guys, you don't know if he worked all day. You don't know what he had to do to just struggle to get to that window. You know what that window was for him? It was a place where he could hear the words of God. Oftentimes people say, ah, Eutychus, he fell asleep, what a bum. I don't know, I sort of seem like a hero. I mean, the guy, who knows how long he was there to even get to the window. But man, he was there. Whatever else you can say about it, you say, well, he fell, he fell asleep. Yeah, but at least he was there. What about those that weren't? You know what Eutychus wanted really badly? He wanted to hear God's words. Let me ask you a question. Tomorrow morning at 5.30, 6 o'clock, 6.30, when that alarm goes off, you know what you have? You have a window of opportunity. You go, no, no, you're just sort of glamorizing that. That's called the, uh, the alarm. <laughs> no, 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 it's a window of opportunity. And instead of looking at it, oh, oh I don't want to get up today. I do not want to get Thank God I can open up this book. Amen. Look at Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. You know, I'll be honest with you. I believe if our country follows the same path that most countries do throughout history, and I heard a long time ago that what men never learn from history is that men never learn from history. And, uh, you know, I don't wish this, I don't desire this, but I, I'm concerned for our country. I am. And, uh, I see more and more as time goes on the secularization, just the, the void of Bible understanding. The, hey, you know what? People say, uh, you know, you're homophobic, or you're this phobic, or Muslim, Islamophobic. Hey, you know what I think most people have? They're Bible phobic. Yeah. They don't know what it is. They're scared of it. You open it up, they start. Listen, I can take a Bible to Starbucks. Take my, you know, this. I mean, I can, it's a little intimidating. You know, it's pretty big. Flop it open. Nobody will come talk to me. It's amazing. I can have a table all by myself. No one will bother me. Say, why is it? As time goes on, our country's going more and more in that direction. And I really honestly believe that what we're headed to is, is a famine. You go, oh, you mean like a physical? No, not a physical one. I think it's spiritual one. If we're not already there. Look at Amos chapter 8. Look at verse number 11. Say, why don't you pray the Lord comes back? Boy, I can't wait to see him. Amen. I know the way this world is headed, and I'll be honest, I'm not super thrilled about my kids living in it. I pray they can be a light in it. As long as the Lord doesn't come back, they can be a light in it and, and be an effect on it. And I pray for that. What a blessing and opportunity that can be. But I think about the window of hearing the words of God. And guys, I'll be honest with you, that window is getting smaller and smaller throughout the world. Right. Even in our own country. Are you taking advantage of it? Look at Amos chapter 8, look at verse number 11. Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of the hearing, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And look what it says here in verse 12. You know that song, America the Beautiful, from sea to shining sea? Look at verse 12. And they shall wander from where? And from the north even to the east. There's Massachusetts. <laughs> they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord. You know what it says? They shall not find it. You have it. You probably have a couple copies in your house. Are you taking advantage of that? The window that's here right now to read it, to receive it, to study it, to memorize it to hide in your heart, to pass it on to somebody else. We've got tracks on that back rack, and there's different kinds. What are you doing? I mean, are you taking advantage of those things? I personally don't believe. I don't believe it for a second. 
that the only way for people to enjoy that window of opportunity is for it to be taken away. I don't think it has to be that way. I think we could if we wanted to. Let me say this lastly. There's windows in the Bible you're receiving God's blessings. Look at 2 Kings chapter number 7. 2 Kings chapter number 7. Are you taking advantage of those open windows? I'll tell you what. Boy, this is one of my favorite times of year. My wife is smiling because she knew exactly what I was about to say. I love when it's about 80 degrees during the daytime and like 50 at night. Amen. Amen. Crank those windows open. Let that air come in and just get that fresh air, that fresh Colorado air in your home. Oh, man, I love it. Why would you want to keep the windows shut if you could have that, right? Spiritually, why would you want the windows to be shut when God wants to refresh you? Look at 2 Kings chapter 7. And look at verse number 2. Then the Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God and said, Behold, that the Lord would make windows where? Might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine own eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. Look at verse 19. And that Lord answered the man of God and said, Now behold, the Lord should make windows in heaven might such a thing be. You know, oftentimes, I mentioned this last week, we picture God as, as just sitting up there in heaven and waiting for us to mess up. And that window would be able to see, zap us with lightning or something, you know, kill you and drop you dead. And I, listen, I don't want to take away from the fact that God is righteous and holy. But let me say this, if you're saved, you're His child. Amen. Listen, man, I don't sit there and just look for my kids to mess up so I can... Nail them for what they did wrong. You know, I want to bless my children. I want to see their lives blessed. I want to see them grow and mature and become a complete individual. That's what your father wants for you. You know, oftentimes what we say, Lord, even if you did open up a window in heaven, would this thing really happen? God, could you really handle this thing? Lord, would you really be able to bless me with that? Well, I'll tell you this. The guy that asked that question, never gets to taste the food. Isn't that interesting? He experiences the famine and doesn't get to see the blessing. You know when you doubt what God wants to do in your life, oftentimes the Lord says, okay. You know, I heard a story about two farmers that prayed for rain and one went out in the field and plowed and one didn't. Who do you think got the blessing? He was prepared and meet for the master's use. Preparation meeting opportunity. Genesis 7, it talks about the windows of heaven being opened for judgment and destruction on this earth. That's Noah's flood. Malachi chapter 3, it talks about windows being opened in heaven to pour out blessing. Oftentimes, we determine which way that thing goes. You know what's interesting? If you look at the Bible, there's a principle. If, if I, then God. If I, listen, if I receive him, he'll make me his child. Amen? If I trust in Him as my Savior, He'll adopt me as one of His sons. If I am willing to acknowledge Him as the King of kings and the Lord of lords in my life on a daily basis, you know what? I can crucify the flesh and have victory. If I, then God, will do this. Listen, man, you want to see God bless you? Look for those up and believe in what He says. How many know any of the promises of God in the Bible? Thou shalt keep Him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee because He trusteth in thee. My God shall supply all my need. Amen? Amen. Not all my greed. Amen? Amen? All my need. But you know, there's all kinds of promises throughout the Word of God. Are you looking for those things to happen? You know, I've been around people that, man, something good can happen, and they can still turn around and say, yeah, well, guess I know something bad's about to happen. <laughs> hey, you know, that's just not the way to live. I'm not talking about a sappy, positive, optimistic, non-biblical outlook. Okay. But you know what the reality is? Bible truth. He's your father. And he doesn't want to bless you. Are you even looking for that? Are you walking with him? Do you have a relationship with him where you even see that? Let's look at Revelation chapter 4 and we're going to be done. Revelation chapter 4. Windows of opportunity. Look at 
there's some things that God wants you to receive. And uh, I can tell you this, I enjoy football. You probably know that already. Watching some preseason games. And uh, boy, I tell you what's really, really sad to watch is this guy who's been in training camp all summer, and he's giving his all, but he's also like the third string guy. And he knows if he doesn't perform, man, he's gone. He's not going to be on the team, right? There goes his wishes being the NFL. And you see that guy, and you know he's got the talent, and four or three times the ball is thrown to him, and he just totally drops him. Now, there's all kinds of reasons, but ultimately it's this. Nine times out of ten, when you look at their face, they're not ready to receive that ball. They're just not, they're, something's not clicking there. And you know what happens, spiritually speaking? Oftentimes, God wants to give you something, and bless you with something, and comfort you with something, and show you something through His Word, and you're just not ready to receive it. And drop the ball. Look at Revelation chapter 4. Look at verse number 1. A door is uh, sort of like a window, sort of similar components anyways. After this I looked and behold, a door was open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, Come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. You know when I read, when I, when I read that, you know what I think of? The biggest blessing you can receive as a Christian is hearing the voice of God in you know what the biggest tragedy is? When God opens that window and He's trying to speak to you in that still small voice and you don't hear it. And you just go along doing whatever it is you're doing. You miss out on something. Let me ask you a question. Would it bother you knowing that God is trying to tell you something? Trying to give you something? And you don't even see Him. You don't even hear Him. Well, God doesn't speak to me in like this audible voice like He did to people in the Old Testament. You know what God uses? He uses this book right here to speak to you. And He uses circumstances in your life to show you things. And oftentimes you walk right by those things. You don't hear the voice of God. You don't see the hand of God where He's trying to do something. Why? It's not ready for it. Hey, you know, and sometimes it's not even sin. It's just you doing what you do every day without trying to find God in all that you do. There's all kinds of different windows spoken of in the Bible. Let me ask you, are you looking for windows of association, windows of escape, windows of hearing God's word, windows of receiving something from you? You know, I believe sometimes we're the ones that not only ignore the window, we shut it. I hope that's not, that's not standing this morning.